Uh, this presentation is not going to be very specific about technology. I'm not going to dive into <coughs> the um, how to uh, implement HubSpot or how to do anything specifically. I do have a slide at the end, a resources slide, that has four or five um, resources that are very much into the how-to. So if anyone is interested, I passed up my business card. Um, I will send you the slide deck afterwards, and then you can just click on those resources and, and uh, learn all the in-depth things you want to learn about how to implement or how to do uh, content marketing. So that's the subtitle um, that Tom was referencing, Content Marketing for the New Owner. And the idea is that um, a uh, content marketing uh, tool or a marketing automation tool is kind of like a puppy. It's kind of unwieldy when you first get it. You, you think it's cute, it's neat, you know, it'll be fun to play with, but then there's just so much. It, it requires so much um, forethought. It requires a lot of attention. You need a lot of experts in some cases. You need a writer, you need a designer, you need a project manager, you need somebody who can at least have the basics of HTML and the other technology. So what I want to do in this presentation is just kind of give you some high level, um, a uh, content marketing uh, tool or a marketing automation tool is kind of like a puppy. It's kind of unwieldy when you first get it. You, you think it's cute, it's neat, you know, it'll be fun to play with, but then there's just so much. It, it requires so much um, forethought. It requires a lot of attention. You need a lot of experts in some cases. You need a writer, you need a designer, you need a project manager, you need somebody who can at least have the basics of HTML and the other technology. So what I want to do in this presentation is just kind of give you some high level things to think about as you're designing the content that will go into your marketing automation tool or will go onto your website um, or will go into your newsletter. So really the information that I share about content marketing is meant to be high level and have a broad ranging um, impact. I'm Rob McDonald. I uh, have been doing content marketing since 1998. I grew up in Chicago, uh, but before I get there, let me do the agenda. So I'm going to share with you first my perspective on the web and content marketing. Uh, I went to a um, American Marketing Association Boston chapter event, and um, there was a, a young person talking about how content marketing really just started a couple of years ago. And I was just smiling and thinking, you just got out of college a couple of years ago. It's, it's been going on for quite a while. Um, so my perspective on content marketing, and then uh, for you, as you develop content for your website or for your marketing automation tool or for your brochure or even for your elevator pitch, should you use wet food or dry food? <laughs> and what do I mean by that? Well, uh, I'll keep you in suspense for a little longer. Uh, I'll showcase some of the um, slides from the Hub, uh, HubSpot app. Um, I use the app to uh, manage clients' <coughs> sites and, uh, and to manage their HubSpot. So I'll show you that. And then the resources that I promised would be last. So I grew up in Chicago, but this is not Chicago. This is Baltimore. This is a seagull's eye view of Baltimore, Maryland. And I moved to Baltimore in 1994 and uh, went into business in 1998. Um, they call this the digital harbor, or at least they did back in the 90s when uh, technology was uh, all of all of, uh, shops around Baltimore were sort of condensed into the inner harbor, uh, so that all the technology things, all the greatest new innovations, were all happening down there. It was a really exciting time back in the early 90s. Um, I had my company Smith Content. This is not me, uh, but that is my sign. <laughs> so there was a rock band out in front of our. Um, out in front of our office, we were on a street in uh, Baltimore called um, The Avenue, and that's uh, it was kind of like a, a little mini Soho with lots of shops and things, lots of artists, and so there were performances, street performances. Uh, but we had this company, Smith Content, from 1998 to 2008 when the credit crunch uh, drove all of our customers away and we had to close our doors. But we, used, we chose this um, old time typewriter as our logo, even though we're a modern at the time, you know, cutting edge, brand new, it's digital, it's, it's online, you don't use paper. We had to convince people about that back in the 90s, how the internet is here to stay. Uh, but we wanted to show our old time commitment to quality, that's why we use that old typewriter. And you can see it's called Smith Content. Um, so content marketing, from my perspective, started in 1998, but maybe that's when I just got out of college, so I don't know. <laughs> but it's probably been uh, going on even before then. Uh, this also is not me. <laughs> I'm going to show you a bunch of home 
slides of somebody else. But the reason this is interesting is this guy, John Ferber and his brother Scott, they were in high school when they um, did something that gave us all jobs. And what they did was, uh, John, the older brother, wrote a piece of code in his basement that tracked clicks for the first time. No one had been able to track a web click before. And once he'd figured out a software that could track clicks, he could sell it to the advertisers and say, wouldn't you like to know how many people clicked on your ad? And wouldn't that be valuable that you could sell your customers if, um, if you could guarantee that you can tell them how many ads, uh, how many clicks were on the ad? Well, that worked and performance marketing was born. Um, John Ferber developed software to track and measure clicks on ads. This was in Baltimore, in the Inner Harbor in 1996. Um, there was a start of performance marketing. Look at this. He sold his company for half a billion dollars and he was only 26 years old, so he uh, <laughs> instantly got on Easy Street. Uh, he moved to Florida and he's been a venture capitalist ever since. Um, a lot of interesting things were happening at the time. Uh, but what this brings us to is the point of no return. Well, performance marketing is here, there's no going back. The ads can be clicked and the clicks can be tracked and now everything can be tracked and, the, and your marketing automation tool can tell you how many people opened the email, um, how many people who opened the email and, and clicked on something and then those who clicked on something got another email because it triggered the workflow and then that gets tracked too. How many people clicked on the blog and what they commented on, you know, there's retweets on social media. Um, everything can be tricked and clicked, tricked, <laughs> tracked and, uh, and improved. So it's the point of no return because there's really no going back and so as you're developing your content marketing strategy for your, um, for your marketing automation tool, um, it's really the only thing you can do is embrace it and go forward. So what is marketing automation? These are just the two big ones. The one here local, we all love HubSpot since they're right next door practically to this building. Uh, Marketo is a similar thing. If you learn one, you learn them all. Just like with um, you know, email, if you learn WebChimp, MailChimp, you can do you know, AWeber, you can do GetResponse. Um, it's transferable skills. They'll change the dashboard on you like they always do so that you get in there and you don't recognize anything, but two seconds later you can figure stuff out. Um, does anybody remember this thing? <laughs> what is it? Tamagotchi. Tamagotchi, yeah. So um, this was a, uh, a very popular toy in the 90s and early 2000s. And uh, what do you remember about it, Daisuke? When I was um, a post in elementary school, it was very popular in Japan. Yep. Uh, it was difficult to get, but everybody wanted. So, like, at the store, like, hour in, like, 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., people just buy it in line. Wow. Uh, like, 10 a.m. open. They were uh, quiet. Like, it was crazy at the time, and that's I remember. Yeah. That's great. Well, yeah, they were, they were popular here, too, and I remember um, uh, a woman in my office had to bring her daughters. Uh, to, to work to keep it alive because <laughs> her daughter was going to be in school and couldn't have it. So this toy, for those who don't know, you had to, you had to like digitally feed it and digitally water it and digitally take care of it and let it go to sleep and when it woke up the next day it was a little bit older. But if you forgot and you left it in your drawer, what would happen? Do you remember? Died. I died! <laughs> You're dead. Like you cut died, yeah. Yeah, we showed a little tombstone up there. So anyway, the reason I, I show this is because it answers this question, what is marketing automation? It's a toy and it takes a lot of upkeep. If you ignore it, it will die. So very similar to the Tamagotchi. And um, the reason for content marketing, this is the, the only slide that I have that has a lot of bullet points and a lot of words on it. So um, this will be the only time I ask you to uh, sort of bear with me on this. But the reason for content marketing is it allows you to uh, establish your brand because people recognize a certain um, information or quality level of information that you share. It allows you to connect with your target audiences where they are. So if they're on Facebook or if they're on Amazon or if they're listening to podcasts on iTunes, um, wherever they are, your content can be there. And you just have to know where they are and then you have to know what they want and put the content in front of them to satisfy them. 
And then the third point is it proves your relevance and authority with Google. And Armin and I were just talking about this with the um, with the website that you have that attracts um, a lot of clicks for people who are searching for uh, was it Somerville artists that come to you? Yeah. So Arm, Arm has a, a site that um, that a lot of Somerville artists link to, and because of that, Google sees these links as an indication of authority and relevance, and so. Uh, our site goes up on the search rankings, and yours would too if you were relevant and demonstrating a lot of authority. So content marketing can help you accomplish all three of these. Um, what is the goal of content marketing, and what's the goal of using marketing automation? It's really this. We want to take a value-driven and educational approach to engaging buyers. The reason is, buyers are smart. They can figure stuff out on their own. They don't need a salesperson, or at least that's what they think. They can go online, they can do their own research, they can look things up, they can self-educate. And if you're the one providing the self-education, you're giving them the content that can teach them how to do what they need to do, then they're gonna see you as the authority and when it is time to make a purchasing decision, that's when they go to you. Um, so how do you do this? How do you take that approach? Um, my, this is my particular take. I say the way that you do it is consider your audience to be one person and that person, a man or a woman, boy or girl, is a learner. Somebody who is trying to solve a problem, which means I don't know how to do something, I want to learn how to do it. So I don't know how to get to the whole business school, <laughs> so I'm going to Google that. I don't know how to um, put a drywall in my basement, so I'm going to Google that. I don't know how to um, evaluate the uh, latest, greatest, um, let's say, accounting software. So I'll Google that. Everyone who Googles anything is a learner because they're trying to learn something. Anyone who goes onto YouTube or, um, or looks for podcasts is trying to learn something. Um, maybe they're trying to learn a, a best way to be um, inspired or educated or even just entertained, but they're still a learner. So the way you reach them is put them first. The way you design your marketing automation strategy is put the learner first. So. Here's the four pieces of the content marketing model. Um, this is really how uh, I consider that, that information moves through the web and gets people to become customers and clients. First, use content to drive traffic in the ways I was just saying. If you're putting up a mean book on Amazon, um, that people like it and then they click on it, um, click the link through, that'll drive traffic to your website. If they find your they do a Google search and they find a uh, white paper that you wrote and there's a link there that'll drive traffic to the website. Um, then you capture the record with a funnel. We're all familiar with this. In WordPress you can do this with a form. You can have a more sophisticated funnel. You offer something, um, an ethical bribe or a freebie, a giveaway. People give their email address to receive the checklist, you know, the 10 top things to avoid or they can sign up for the webinar or uh, they can um, get uh, an ebook or whatever it is that you're offering. What happens next is you're firing your workflow, I'm sorry, your workflow triggers. This is in, uh, a phrase that's in HubSpot but also in the other automation tools. Even MailChimp has triggers and that's just um, an, a, one of the people in your record, in your um, database takes a certain action and based on that action they get something else. So it might be you, um, let's say you put a survey up on SurveyMonkey and you have you share the link on LinkedIn and a compelling message like um, find out wh what to do when somebody cries at work or something shocking like that, I don't know. And then people click on the survey and based on how they respond to the survey you could send them a customized message the trick, so, so if they say in the survey, you say, um, "Would you like to hear from a salesperson after you've completed the survey?" And they click no, they get one message. If they click yes, they get a different message. So you're firing triggers with your content. And the last thing is just to help the learner along the buyer's journey or the buying journey. And the um, next few things that I want to talk about have to do with the buying journey. This is really the heart and soul of the marketing automation. Uh, strategy that you need. This is the food that you feed your marketing automation tool with and that is an understanding of what the buyer's journey is and content that they need to make the next step. So 
to get there, um, first think about the dog food. What's in the dog food? These are all the things. I mean, there's others. But, um, but when you think about all the types of content that you can provide to get people to come to your website and engage the buyer, um, email is a great one, social media, doing blog posts, and then downloadables are the things that I just mentioned. It could be you know, a white paper, it could be um, an infographic or a checklist or a guide. And then the sign up bubbles would be come to our event, come to our um, webinar, sign up to be a member of our, our program. Um, so these are all different types of what I call dog food, things that we feed our, um, our audience. And so here's the big question, dry food or wet? Well, dry food is um, sort of like analytical, statistical um, data, which is often important deep into the sales cycle because people are already informed and they want to make a, a smart, logical decision. Before they get down there, they need the wet food, what I consider the wet food, which is the delicious stuff, the, um, the kind of higher level. It's attractive and um, it gets them into the funnel. So in order to think about um, what kind of um, food or what kind of content you provide to buyers when they're in the buying journey, I like to think of it as the hero's journey. Is anyone familiar with the, uh, the thinker Joseph Campbell and, the, and Tom knows and a couple of folks know. So, uh, so he, Joseph Campbell created this concept that, um, that there is one hero, all of us, are the hero and there's a thousand different faces for the hero we can all look differently but we're all going through the same exact process our buyers too the people that we're marketing to are on a quest they're on their own hero's journey so a lot of marketers make the big mistake of thinking that i'm the hero well i'm not the hero it's my client who's the hero or my buyer so i want to celebrate my buyer i don't want to celebrate myself a lot of websites are screwed up because they, they think, you know, in their enthusiasm for creating this big, beautiful website, that the website creator is the hero. And so they make it look the way they want it to be. Well, that's a mistake because the web designer is not the hero, it's the buyer, it's the person visiting the website. So here are some of the stages um, that we go through. Uh, the hero's journey that starts off with once upon a time, there was a problem. And if you know Star Wars, this is a movie that a lot of us have seen, so I chose this one. Um, the problem, the big problem here is, um, it's kind of a gross picture, but there's a dead person back there. Luke sees his family killed. So his problem at the start of the story wheel is that um, he's on his own. A minute ago he had a family and a farm, and now he's on his own. Um, the problems that your clients are dealing with, that hopefully are not this extreme, but their problems are something like, I can't get my... Um, I can't get my uh, accounting information processed correctly, or I can't um, I can't solve my legal woes, or whatever it is. There's there's some problem that they can't solve on their own. And when you're creating content, you want to demonstrate that you know what their problem is. So um, the next phase of the hero cycle in Star Wars is the consequences. The problem gets worse. So not only did Luke decide, okay, I'm going to leave my home since everyone's dead. I'm going to go into space and fight the bad guys. Well, there's the bad guy. He's you know the supreme bad guy who who can kill you without even touching you. Um, the next phase is when the hero says, "There's got to be a way." So as the marketer and your content marketing um, program allows you to identify the problem and, and create content that, like I just said, the top 10 things to avoid, that's a problem that someone would avoid. Um, consequences would be like, are you losing, um, you're, you could be losing 50% of your profit to um, poor software implementation. A vision would be when we say, here, there is a way. We've got a way to solve your, your problem. And then marketing, um, this is, in content marketing, this is really the crux of what you're doing, which is providing them valuable information they can use to do their jobs better. And the last phase is the reward. So this is uh, this is that happy victory when the hero um, who started with a problem, the problems got worse, then they had a vision for solving it, and then did solve their problem. So the solution is going to be, you know, when we give them something to um, something they can say yes to, something that will help them. And as a marketer, if you demonstrate all this in your content, um, you are kind of giving them a preview of what it will be like to work for you, uh, work with you. The client can solve, potentially can solve all their problems without even talking to you. 
Um, and if they do, that's fine. Who knows, they might be a referral for you. Someone might say, do you know anyone who can help you with this problem? And then they would say, well, I've been reading all these blog posts, or I've been getting white books, or white, uh, white, white papers and e-books from this company, and I recommend you look into them. So in all of these phases, um, that's the goal. Put the learner first and take them through the story wheel with all of your content. and. Um, and you've seen this probably, you've probably done this too in your own um, content without maybe necessarily realizing that's what you're doing, but you are putting the learner first. You're recognizing that that learner has a problem. And after all, you know, that's what business is about, right? We're here to solve problems. If there's no problem, there's no business. Uh, so problems are a big deal. At the same time, and I find this to be an interesting uh, paradox, people do business with people they like. And people, we like people who make us feel good, people who make us smile, people who don't take themselves too seriously. So there's kind of a, a, a paradox in that business is very serious and we want to solve serious problems, but we want to work with people that we like, people who can talk to us, people who can entertain us, people who can keep us smiling. So by using a system like this, a story wheel that puts the learner first and communicates where they are throughout the whole journey, you're kind of playing the best of both worlds. You're taking this problem very seriously, and you are being an entertaining uh, companion who can give them information that they find useful. Um, well, before I dive into this, does anyone have any questions about the, uh, the story wheel and how you might implement that? Um, it's very conceptual. I know, as I said, the last slide has the, uh, the resources where you can dig in and find out about exactly where to quick content, what goes where. Um, but um, I uh, promised Tom I would showcase a few things on the HubSpot app. Um, the, this is the icon down here. Um, and um, it's, it's useful for um, checking. So like if you're on the subway and you want to see did the email actually go out and how many people opened it, you can check it and, and look at the stats. It's not really useful for doing anything, really. You can, it's too small, I find. You know, I'd rather just sit down at my computer and do stuff. But the app is useful for checking. And this is some of the things you can see. So you log in here. And then um, these are all of your heroes, all of your learners. These are just people who are in the um, system. You can also, um, so, oops. This tab is contacts on the left. And then if you touch over there on the right, then you can see the companies they're with. Um, this is a screen that gives analytics, so you can kind of get a top line picture just like you would if you were sitting down at your desk and see what the open rates were and when people did things. Um, this shows the deliverability. I like this. This is probably the screen that I use most in the app because you can, you know, at a glance see the type of things that you need to see. Awesome open rate, 77%. Yeah, way. <laughs> But you can also tap on that, and then you can go in and read the um, you can read the email if you want to see what it said. Um, this is just another campaign we did that um, has, I guess, pretty much the same information. Um, this shows the engagement, so you can um, you can tap on these things too and drill down a little bit. <coughs> this high level, as I said, when you're sitting on the subway and you want to see how your campaign did before you get to your desk. Uh, that will help you with that. Um, this is similar again to what you would see if you're looking at your analytics, open rates by device, if they used a laptop or if they were on the desktop. Um, interesting, um, this, I just didn't notice this until I did it, but no one who looked at it on their device clicked on it. But almost 20% of the people who looked at it, oh wait, no, I guess this is, these are both desktop. Well, this one, I guess it was different emails, so one of the emails was read on, on the... For some reason, our second email didn't get opened at all on the device, so I guess I should look at that. But that's one, one of the good things about having the analytics. You can see if something weird shows up and you go, did I like forget to optimize it for mobile, or what's my problem here? Why didn't anybody read it? Um, this one, you know, another screen about the deliverability rate, 98%. You can see there were some bounces and some unsubscribes. I didn't have anything in the deals, but I just put this in here so you can see it. If you go to um, this screen, um, same thing with tasks. You can show all your tasks. I use Asana. I don't use the HubSpot one. Um, and that's another nice thing about HubSpot or Marketo is 
you don't have to use every single feature of it. It's good, you know, just use the ones that you want to. And if you have a project management tool that you like better than theirs, or you're comfortable with it, it's a pain in the butt to learn a new one, just keep using yours. So I didn't find any real value to, to switching that. Um, the deals, um, you know, if you're, so, so you, you mentioned that you're doing the uh, Salesforce and uh, HubSpot together, so you probably are pulling your deals through and you'd be able to look at where you are on your deals. Um, and uh, so that that's kind of a quick overview. Um, my my takeaway, if uh, if there's one thing that you do take away and think about what, what am I going to do with my marketing automation tool and how am I going to feed it with the content that keeps buyers um, engaged in my brand and turns them into customers or clients, put them first. Think of them as a learner and put the learner first. And um, here are the resources that I mentioned. Um, the Content marketing playlist. This this has something like 20 videos, and they're all pretty short, like seven or eight minutes. And I find that one really useful because it takes a high-level perspective and also drills down a little bit. So you kind of get um, one one big thought and then really specific details on how to implement it. This is a good site for how to craft content. So if you're not a writer um, or if you are a writer, but you write poetry or long form essays or something, and you want to know like what's a good way to write content for the web, this is a really good use, uh, YouTube. These are all YouTube channels, by the way. A really good tutorial um, here at uh, the, um, on that site. And then this one is how to send content via a drip email workflow. This is really the first thing that people do when they come to a marketing automation tool. At least that's what brought me there <laughs> 10 or more years ago. I wanted to send emails and I wanted to do it without having to you know, be the one who's constantly sending them every time. So you can set up, you can write six emails, um, have it trigger when somebody downloads your ebook or signs up for your newsletter, and then over the course of six weeks or six months or whatever, they'll get a different email. This link tells you how to set that up. On, um, it's sort of agnostic of which tool you are. It can work in HubSpot, it can work in MailChimp. And then this last one is here, how to actually create a blog inside of HubSpot. If you are using HubSpot, it says, you know, go over here, click this tab, draw that down, select that, and press that button. And then, okay, that's great, the technology gets you into the right place, but what words are you going to use? What content are you going to write? And the answer is, you're going to write the kind of content that puts the learner first, that pays attention to where they are in the hero cycle, and that uses messaging that um, helps them do their jobs better so that they know who to go to when they're finally ready to make a purchasing decision. That is the presentation, so may the force be with you as you continue your growth quest. And uh, as I said, if you would like to have a copy of the deck, just let me know, email me, and I will email it back to you. Thanks very much. Does anybody have any questions? Anything you're thinking about with your own content marketing plan? Has anybody ever done a content marketing plan? Yes. Yes? You said yes, Isabel? What, what, was, uh, what were you trying to do with your content marketing? It's more in part A. I'm class with projects or class with marketing class, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to do the marketing strategy around uh, a new platform which was now in a countries. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, cool. So it was really, I mean, regarding also the social media platforms, so mm -hmm. to see which effect it was and which strategy to launch on it. Okay. So, what did you learn from that? Um, it was interesting. It was long work. Okay, <laughs> yeah. And, um, well, but on with those, we, I mean, in this project, we haven't used exactly uh, different websites where you can also measure mm -hmm. the impact of uh, the content which we have launched. Mm -hmm. But for a project which I built up last year and for a startup, there we used, for example, Brand24, I think, if okay. I'm not wrong. I don't know if you heard about it. I don't know about that. It's uh, a tool which helps you to measure also then the impact on the different uh, social media posts you make and yep. the, okay. yeah, the marketing, the advertising impacts. 
mm -hmm. with the audience. Cool. And this is really interesting. So at least you know which. How do you need to change your way of advertising a product mm -hmm. regarding the the audience? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, Isabel brings up a good point, and that's that you know you want to be able to track it. You want to know what's happening, and then you can decide if, if it's working. Then we'll keep doing more, and if it's not, we'll do something else. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just kind of like continuing to do, yeah, without knowing uh, what you're doing. Kevin, the hero's journey is that something that would be all encompassed in like one email, one post, or something, or is that divided up amongst things? Because I can, I can think of a nice story, but I don't know whether it all comes at once. Right. Um, well, that's a great question, and there's um, sometimes, for example, the typical case study uses the whole hero cycle in one. So that starts with the company had a problem, uh, they, they couldn't do whatever it is. And the consequences of the problem were they were missing all these opportunities to grow. Um, when, when they came to the turning point, um, they realized that the, this wasn't acceptable, they had to do something about it, and um, they called us in, and we gave them a vision. What if you were able to solve all your problems and everyone could have cake? And then they decided, yes, we're going to do that, and after six months of rigorous implementation, they succeeded. So there, I just went all the way through the whole mm -hmm. hero cycle, and that's really what a case study does. But when you're, um, when you're using a drip campaign, you, you would break it up into, let's say you had a, a six part email campaign, you would focus just on the problem and show how well you understood the problem. And then um, you know, the next one would be all about the, the consequences of the problem. You do want to give them a little hint you know, that we can help you at the end of every email. So you don't want to just talk about the problem and leave them hanging there. Yeah. Um, but it's good to, um, it's good to have some standalone pieces that are really heavy with the problem. And if you haven't done this with your own business, I recommend um, you know you can interview your clients, you can talk to your salespeople who are interviewing clients every day, or you can um, kind of just use you know your own uh, hunch of what you think is the problem and then test it out. But um, create a document that's all about the problem, all about how bad things are. You know the. Um, a lot of times, the, the, uh, the old comic was, you know, do you want to buy a watch? The guy in New York City would open his shirt and he'd have 15 watches hanging down. And, um, you know, everybody's like, no, I have, I have a watch. You know, so do you want to buy a watch? And the only person who's going to buy a watch is the person who doesn't have a watch and sees that guy. Um, so that's kind of, that's the old school sales. Um, that's not the kind of sales that we're doing. Instead, we're doing, you know, you might have a watch, but, um, have you ever been late, or have you have you ever had the problem of not being able to find your watch, or the watch didn't go with your outfit, or I don't know what all the problems might be with the watch. But in, in the content that you create that's all around the problem, you can develop that and you can really tease it out so that you have a story um, that's ready to go, which you can use in your marketing, but also you can use in, in sales conversations. Everyone loves problems, and as I said, that's what businesses are about, solving problems. Any other comments or questions or nice to get? I had uh, experience during my project uh, having podcast program. But the business segment is towards Japanese people. From here, the people who are well, I was at that time I was a student at the undergraduate uh, program in uh, University of New Hampshire, Manchester. Um, I was trying to create a show to people. Try to like endorse people to like learning English or like study abroad in the United States or Japan. So I realized I created like since 2016 till like uh, 2019. Like so far, I just um, it would it happens a lot of uh, things. So like I I don't do right now, but um, continually doing uh, for two three years. Um, I realize when I create, okay, but when I create, I publish to the iTunes and also um, through YouTube, different segment. Mm -hmm. But I realize because of the keywords, uh, for example, on YouTube, mm -hmm. people find easy to show, but if the keywords is kind of unusual or it's not very popular thing, in Japan it's kind of difficult to reach to those people who are trying to generate like looking up other words because of the uh, SEO 
in the market anyways. Yep. Uh, it is important to match with the yeah, kind of buzzword. Yeah, kind of it, that's a good point, and I would just um, connect it back to the presentation by saying it's the word that the learner is searching for. I want to learn something, so I'm using the word that I'm trying to figure out. And if it's an obscure word, it's because not a lot of people are trying to learn about that obscure word. <laughs> and at the same time, um, nowadays, you know, Google uh, Analytics is available, so I was trying to analyze the um, my size, like what kind of people come through, and you know, or I saw a lot of bots or something like what do I just see into mm -hmm. my page, but yeah, it was kind of an interesting like, experience. Yeah, cool, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else have any comments about your experiences? Reka? Well, I have a question. Um, what's your experience with um, Blackbot and using Salesforce for like medium sized companies? Yeah, well, it's you have to have a sales team. I mean, it's it's good too for for the for the owner, but it's really a complex tool that works best when there's a lot of people using it. So, um, for example, the, the company that I showed their um, their screen with, it is they have a six person sales team, and the reason that it's, it's really great is for things like um, meeting. So we do a lot of meeting generation. When you have salespeople, you want them to get meetings, and uh, and so. Um, the surveys that we send or the emails that we send out um, have that question, would you like to hear from someone? Would you like an expert to talk to you? Would you like to schedule a free one hour consulting session? You know, we have all these different calls to action that are designed to get the person who gets the marketing to interact with the salesperson. And so when they click yes, or, and then it goes to the meeting calendar, the meeting calendar is hooked up between Salesforce and HubSpot. And so they can choose, you know, you've seen this Probably have it. Um, you can choose the open time, you know, 15 minutes on Tuesday, and then they sign up for it. The user then gets an email saying, um, "Thank you for signing up for a, an email. I'm uh, signing up for a meeting. Um, we'll notify you again 15 minutes before the meeting." And the salesperson who is in Salesforce also gets a notification from HubSpot saying somebody signed up for a time slot with you. So it's um, it's great. It's, I, I, um, Ten years ago, I think, or maybe nine years ago, when I first started working with HubSpot, and didn't um, integrate with uh, with Salesforce, so you had to use something else. We had to use uh, Pardot, I think it's called. But now there's there's um, integration tools for that. Um, you also uh, there was something else you couldn't do a while ago with HubSpot that they've solved. Um, I can't remember, but now it's now everything's all seamlessly integrated, so it's really easy to do. You can get the SurveyMonkey in, in, integration. Um, if you wanted to use MailChimp, you still can use MailChimp and hook it into your HubSpot, so you just won't be using the HubSpot version. And it's all pretty much the same anyway, it doesn't matter, but <laughs> I mean, I, th I think, for me anyway, it's better to stick with the HubSpot emailing and this HubSpot CRM and connecting to Salesforce with things like that meeting calendar link. Um, it's all really useful. Anybody else have a question or comment or ideas for what you might try? Okay, well thanks again. Have a